Good morning, Judge Smith. Good morning, uh, are you ready? Deputy Can Chief we... Justice and Commissioners. How are you this morning? I am fine, thank you. Good. As fine as could be. <laughs> Don't worry, you, you, we will handle you gently. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> thank you for it. You were born in Heschel? Yes, I was. Did you uh, spend any time there? Not, uh, we, we left, my family left uh, when I was still a baby, but we mm. go back often right. on pilgrimages, family pilgrimages, and yeah. go and look at uh, where we grew up and, mm. and ran around, yeah. Uh, well, my family is originally from there, and I remember it is one of the coldest places in it South is. Africa. <laughs> it is. You, don't, you definitely don't want to spend winter there. No. Nah. Yeah. You have a BA law degree from UWC and LLB from Rhodes and a diploma in labor law from UCT. Is that right? That is correct, yes. And you did your articles of clerkship with Mlalana attorneys yes. in the early 80s? Yes, I did. Uh, and I was there with my, with my two future partners, uh, Tabata and Van Yerden, and we all did our articles with uh, uh, the Templeton and Mlalana attorneys. Yes. Oh, is, is that where this lesson was yes. initially formed? <laughs> yes. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> and you... You were an attorney with that firm of attorneys uh, from 1984 until 1996. Is that right? Yes, that is, that is correct, yes. And then there was a break. You became an MP for, for, an, yes, an that ASMP was, uh, for, for two yeah, years. That, that was about <laughs> 18, 18 months or so mm -hmm. uh, before I came back uh, to the to the legal practice again. Yeah. Yeah. The lawyer in you kicked yes, uh, right did, back yeah. and you came back. But tail between my legs and begged my partners to take me back. <laughs> <laughs> and you were with that firm until 2020? Sorry, 20, 2010? 2010, yes, when I applied for permanent position, yes. Mm -hmm. And when did you become a judge then? In 2010, yes. I think right. it was in July 2010. In which division? In the Eastern Cape. In uh, Grahamstown? In Grahamstown, yes, Makanda. Uh. All right. You have acted at the SCA for a few stints. Just remind me how many times uh, were uh, they? It was, it's, the I started, I think it was three terms. I started in October, mm. October last year until May this year. Right. So three terms. How did you find your time there? Um, it was challenging. Uh, Deputy CJ, uh, uh, different, very different from, from how things work at, at the High Court. How so? Um, uh, you, you need to, first of all, there's a lot of reading to be done. Um, um, I nearly had a heart attack when they delivered all the boxes <laughs> <laughs> containing the records to my home because when I started uh, initially for the first time, it was... Uh, Still, everything was still being done virtually at the time. So, so all these records came and uh, you realize now it's, it's now time to read everything and uh, you, you need to, to find your feet very quickly and work out a system. Uh, 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 how you're going to manage your time, uh, which record you're going to, to read and uh, by what time you need to finish with a particular record. So you need to plan very quickly, otherwise you, you're going to be, to be sinking. And uh, one of the uh, uh, Supreme Court uh, judges who hail from the Eastern Cape also advised me that, uh, you know, you read your record first time, you make notes in all the matters where you will be sitting, uh, whether you are the scribe or not, mm -hmm. because you're going to be required to make contributions, you're going to be have to be prepared for the hearing and you will have to engage with counsel and after, after the hearing there's going to be a post-hearing post conference where your views will be elicited and you need to, to be able to make a contribution. Mm. 
So it dawned upon me very quickly that I need to work out the system for myself and I need to, 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 to plan so that I can be prepared when, when the term starts. Did you get an opportunity to write judgments? Yes, I did. Um, I think I wrote five judgments in all. Um, there was one, it was going to be six judgments, but there was one matter where uh, uh, Judge Pete Mayer and I were going to be ascribing together because it was a complicated matter, long matter involving liquidations and uh, business rescue proceedings. And what happened was that uh, during the course of argument, the, the point on which I was going to write was conceded. <laughs> so, so unfortunately then it, it was not necessary for me to write and, uh, and Pete was then then just wrote the judgment by himself. Mm. After all the reading you'd done. After all the reading yeah. and preparation that I had done. Did you struggle to write judgments? How, how is your judgment writing, um, I, your judgment writing skills? I, 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 don't, I don't think that I struggled. It was different uh, because, of course, I was told um, at the very first opportunity, I was told that you don't write just for yourself, you write for the court. So it is very different, but, but the, the, the style of writing uh, appealed to me immediately when I saw when I was given uh, what is called the style guide and became aware of what is required for me. It, it, I, I took to it immediately because I have a particular way of, of writing my, my judgments. I, it, it, it is uh, uh, sort of encompassed in, in, uh, in an article that I wrote at, uh, at uh, Madlanga J's request for the CJ, uh, CJ uh, Journal, um, which is entitled um, The Case for More accessible judgments and there's a number of the things that uh, I personally mentioned and advised uh, readers on how to approach judgment writing that, uh, that were told to me at, at the Supreme Court of Appeal that this is how things work here and this is what is required of you. So I think oh, of course uh, my, my uh, uh, the judges who sat with me and the presiders and cases where I sat would be, would be better able to, <clears throat> to judge my, my uh, uh, judgment writing and, and whether the drafts which I presented to them were, in their view, good enough. But, but I thought uh, that I did okay. Um, I like judgment writing. It's the part of... Uh, of, of uh, being a judge that I enjoy most. Well, it is the core function of a Abs judge after Absolutely, all. yes, I, I enjoy it. And uh, I enjoy it even more if I get a draft out immediately. And that's one of the, uh, one of the core issues that I also uh, 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 mentioned in my, in my article, that if you want to enjoy judgment writing, make sure that you do get a draft out immediately. Otherwise, you're going to put yourself under pressure and then uh, 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 mistakes and omissions will, will creep in. So I try to do that, and in my experience, it has worked well. It gives you an opportunity after your first draft to let it stew a bit, mm. so to speak. Yeah. And then you look at it again, and uh, you can look at it with, uh, with fresh eyes. Uh, so that is, that is my my approach. And, and I also, uh, unlike uh, uh, some of the judges that, that acted in, in the SCA, where they thought that uh, uh, it's the, the judgments are, uh, shall I say, extraordinarily concise. To me, it, I, I didn't get that impression. The impression that I did get was because when you get to the Supreme Court of Appeal, issues would have, uh, would have been ventilated in the court below. 
uh, uh, there would have been points that had been taken in the court below and on which a judge would have had to pronounce. There would have been a set of facts that may have been relevant to pronouncements of findings made in the court below, which are conceded an appeal or not pursued with. So then it is not necessary for you to, to go into all of that. You then just concentrate on the issues that has to be decided the facts upon which those issues are, are founded and the law that you have to apply, and then you, you take your decision. Mm -hmm. and, and I do subscribe to, the, uh, subscribe to the belief that anything more than that you are waffling. If you, if you say more than you need to say, if you have set out the facts, you set out the law, you apply the law, you deal with the arguments for and against certain points, then you make your findings and then that is it. Mm. So I, I found that, that at the Supreme Court of Appeal, that is what happens, that, uh, that you are required to concentrate, first of all, on the facts that are relevant. You are required to summarize those facts and, and it takes a lot of work. Uh, mm. uh, uh, prolixity, prolixity is, uh, is, is easier than concision. It takes a lot of work to, to, uh, to concisely summarize only the relevant facts upon which you're going to base your, 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 your conclusions and findings. And also to steer away from whole scale importation of, uh, of quotations. Uh, it, it's very seldom necessary, just by way of example, it's very seldom necessary to to uh, quote the, the notice of motion when there's a long, mm. uh, for long paragraphs on relief, it's, it's not necessary to quote the entire notice of motion. It may be necessary in certain circumstances, but in most circumstances, a short paragraph that encapsulates the relief that is being, that is being sought and, uh, and, and, and the same with regard to quotations from other cases. If you, if you, if you quote whole-scale importation of quotes uh, makes for prolixity. Sometimes you cannot avoid it. Sometimes you want, uh, because it has been set in a particular way in the judgment and you want to repeat that, you do that. But, but often you can read the judgment, read the portion that you want to rely on, and summarize it concisely and in simple terms for the reader so that he or she can understand what, you, what you're saying. Um, it, it also makes your judgment less intimidating if you, if you do that. So, yeah. so what, what I'm saying in a roundabout way, uh, Deputy C CJ, is that uh, I, I immediately liked the, the style of the SCA, and I've tried from my first judgment to to comply with that style, and I hope that I was successful in, in doing that. Mm -hmm. But I must admit, it's a very steep learning curve. It is different. You need to work hard. Uh, you are under pressure because your, your judgments are scrutinized by four other uh, 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 fellow judges who are at least three of them are far more experienced than you are. So, very intimidating, but uh, I found that if you work hard and if you if you uh, apply yourself, um, I think you you should be okay. Um, obviously, you'll get better the longer you're there, but yeah. uh, but I do I do think that I was able to to overcome that first hurdle. And did you get um, good feedback from your colleagues there, especially the senior ones? I did. Uh, uh, on your work, that is. Yes, I, I did. In, in most of my judgments, there were like uh, comments and, and suggestions. I don't think that, uh, that they were uh, issues of substance in that they uh, 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 fundamentally would change the, the core of my reasoning or, or uh, uh, the, the application of the law. Uh, some of these comments were, wouldn't it be better if you put it that way and you look at it and say, well, I didn't think about that, but 
it actually does sound better and it would make it clearer for the reader if it's put that way. So, yeah, there's been some comments and obviously you, you, you often make uh, 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 errors also, the spelling errors that creep in and no matter how many times you read it, yeah. it, will, it <laughs> they will be there. Um, and uh, it's good to have other judges to look at it because what also, especially when we went back uh, uh, physically to the SCA, it's a bit intimidating when you sit there in the conference when you've presented your, your, your judgment and uh, it's literally scrutinized and taken apart sentence by sentence. So, so if, you, if you go through that process, the first time it is, it's very daunting and intimidating, but if you go through it, you, you, gain, you gain, especially if, you, if the first time you hear the comments and you think, oh, well, okay, at least I didn't miss, completely miss the point here. I, I'm making sense to my colleagues and they agree with me, then you, you, you get a bit more confident. Were you able to deliver your judgments in time, promptly, that is? I think so. Um, I don't think there was any of the judgments that were, that were out of time. Um, there was one occasion when the, the uh, acting, uh, uh, acting president really gave me a heart attack when he, he wrote to me, or rather his secretary, I think, wrote to me and said, look, it's, a, it's almost a month now and there's no, there's no uh, draft yet, what is happening? And I looked at it and I thought, oh no, they forgot about the fact that the case didn't proceed oh. on the date <laughs> that it was supposed to proceed. It was actually two weeks. In fact, it was, it was just on the last day mm. of my acting appointment, right at the end of the term. So, so yeah, after that, uh, fortunately, didn't hear what I was saying, but, <laughs> but, I'll be sure but that was, uh, but, but it was, it was in time also. So I don't, I don't think, I cannot recall, I think all my judgments were delivered in time. All right. I'm going to hand over to my colleagues to put questions to you. And I have just a small piece of advice to give. Try to keep your answers as short as, as, yes. po as possible. <laughs> Otherwise, sure. you'll find yourself sitting in that chair for hours. <laughs> yes, I'll, I'll do that. Thanks, sir. CJ, for the advice. Go ahead, Prof. Thank you very much, Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, good morning, Judge. Good morning. Yeah, still good morning. Um, I, you know, I, I've read all the six judgments, I think five, actually, yes. uh, that, you, that you authored in the Supreme Court of Appeal. Um, and two were, were most concerning to, to me. The one dealing with trademarks, where I think the, the presider there was the deputy, uh, deputy chief justice, then president of the court at the time. Um, I'm not sure you, you remember that case. No, I think you don't. Dealing with trademarks. Yes. No, no, I didn't. Uh, I didn't write such a judgment, commissioner. Yes, uh, the, <laughs> what, what the parties the are uh, Cochrane Steel Products versus oh. Jamulu. It says here, uh, Mayor AJA. Oh, it's myth. <laughs> oh. Yes. No, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Deputy Chief Justice. What, what, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What did you think you are, you are questioning, uh, Commissioner? <laughs> no, no I'm, 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 I'm sorry. No, no, I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah. The one that you... Um, that, I, am, I am relieved, uh, Commissioner. No, I'm sorry. The one that you yeah. wrote... No, no, I'm, so, I'm yeah. sorry. Yes, you are, you're quite right. The one that you, that you wrote is um, Municipal Employees Pension Fund versus Modal. Yes. 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 That's the one that actually I want to talk to you about. I'm yes. sorry about that, Deputy Chief Justice. Yes. <laughs> uh, this is an, 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 important, an important judgment yes. um, because the issue here was um, whether, whether a retirement fund can amend its rules retrospectively, uh, retrospectively yes. to affect accrued retirement funds. And the pension funds adjudicator said, you cannot do that. The quarter call said, 
you cannot do that. Um, the full bench, two to one, um, the majority said you cannot do that, and the minority said, well, you can. In your judgment, um, you said that, yes, um, retirement funds can actually amend their rules, which is true they can, in terms of the Pension Funds Act, retrospectively. But the question that was alive was whether accrued benefits can actually be, be, be reduced if the amendment was not approved and registered by the authority, the FSCA. Are you with me? Yes. Yes. Now, in this judgment, my challenge is you do not refer to the Interpretation Act, Section 12, which actually has the answer that you cannot amend to affect accrued rights. And you don't deal with that in this section. But most importantly, you appear to have overturned a locus classicus, Musteri. I'm not sure you remember that judgment. No. On the same matter. Um, which was referred to by the adjudicator, was referred to by the quota co, was referred to by the full bench. But in your judgment, you don't even refer to it. But you overturn it. Because in that judgment, in Mustad, um, the Supreme Court of Appeal said, you cannot amend your rules retrospectively to impact um, accrued rights. Well, you can amend retrospectively, but not to impact accrued rights. I'm not sure what is your comment on that, because I find this judgment quite unfortunate. I'm, 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 I'm not sure. Uh, I, I, first of all, of course, I wrote the judgment, and I came to that conclusion. Um, but not only I came to the conclusion, it was the entire bench that came to the conclusion. Yes, that's where the problem the, is. The, 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 the issue is simply that uh, retrospectivity, by its very nature, affect existing, pre-existing rights. Otherwise, you, you can never have anything operating retrospectively. It doesn't mean anything if you say an act operates retrospectively, but it cannot affect rights. It, it simply means that it is then prospective. And, and I think that is the basis on which we, on, on which we, we dealt with it. I and, 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 and I think what you're referring to is that there is a strong, very strong presumption against retrospectivity, and for good reasons, um, that you cannot just willy-nilly interfere with existing rights. You, you, you're right about that. But, but the fact of the matter is that if uh, either the, the legislature or any, any institution or organ of state is vested with the power, uh, has that power to, 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 to make a rule or, or a law retrospective, it's going to affect uh, existing rights. But it needs to be clear. And we said that unfortunately for Mr. Madaw, and it wasn't as if we were unsympathetic to his plight, we said unfortunately for him, the, 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 the rule was very clear in what it sought to, to achieve. But, but that's how we saw it, and that is how we called it. And maybe the matter will go to the Constitutional Court, and they will look at it differently. Yes. But, uh, but, but fundamentally, as I understand the law, as I say, just to summarize quickly, yes, strong presumption against retrospectivity for good reason. But where the law is very clear that it has retrospective effect, then the courts must give, uh, uh, must give uh, uh, effect. To, to that particular clause. No, no, thank you very much. Um, I, I just want to refer you to the law that you say is it's clear. Yeah. Um, section 12 2C of the Interpretation Act says, where a law repeals other law, then unless the contrary intention appears, the repeal shall not affect any right, privilege, obligation, or liability acquired, accrued, or incurred under any law so repealed. Yeah, but, but just go back. Just uh, reverse back and just read the first portion of that, and your answer will be there. And that's exactly what I was trying to explain to you. Unless the contrary is clearly evident from the law itself. So you have to interpret it and have to ask yourself, is there a clear intention here to interfere with existing rights? But again, sorry, Deputy Chief Justice, um, if you can just be patient with me, because I think this is important. 
Um, I'm trying. To, I'm going to try to keep it short, but if just, I, I just beg for your indulgence, because really this is impa uh, has really impacted a lot of members out there. So I just want to to deal with it. Yes, uh, the law that is applicable is actually Section 12, one and four of the Pension Funds Act. Um, and when you read that section quite clearly, it allows for retrospective application of the law, but it does not allow for the retrospective impact on recruit, uh, on accrued rights. And that's where the issue is. And be before we, we debate that, I want to take you to Mustad, um, where, the actu where actually the, the, the Supreme Court of Appeal deals with this issue. And I would have expected that even if you have a strong view on it, at least what you will do is you refer to Mustad and you tell us as to why it is wrong and why your approach is right. And that's where, what I'm taking issue with you. Because that particular, that particular judgment, it clearly states that you cannot impact. In, in, in fact, it deals with the Interpretation Act. It deals with Section 12, 1, and 4 of the Pension Funds Act. It deals with it, and it explains to us in that context, in the context of rule amendment, you cannot. You can, yes, you can retrospectively do what you are doing, but you cannot impact accrued rights. But in your judgment, you overturn that judgment, you and your colleagues, of course. You overturn that judgment, but you don't refer to it. And you don't tell us why it is wrong. That's what I'm taking issue yes, with. Yes, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying, but, but I, I don't have that case before me now, but I can say with a great deal of confidence that that judgment cannot say what you say it, it says, because uh, you just read the, the Interpretation Act. It, it would be anomalous for there to be a provision for retrospective enactment of legislation or a rule or anything. But you say it's going to be retrospective, but it's not going to have any effect. It, 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 with all due respect to me, it just does not make sense. And I, and I do not believe that the judgment can say that. Our law has always been strong presumption against any uh, legal instrument that purports to interfere with, uh, with uh, existing, existing rights, but where the context and on a proper interpretation applying, applying accepted canons of construction, if it is clear that that is exactly what was meant, then it must be, it must be uh, 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 unless, unless there is a challenge to that particular rule a challenge that says it is unconstitutional because this is the consequences, but before us there was no such challenge. So the constitutionality of the rule was never an issue. And I'm with you, it, it, there may well be an argument to say that if it is implemented in this way, it is going to have these uh, 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 unfair consequences and impact on, on the rights of uh, uh, existing rights of individuals. But but we were just required to interpret the provision and to decide whether by a proper reading thereof it has the effect of retroactively interfering with rights. And, and it was very clear that that was exactly the purpose because that is why it was done. So unfortunately, we, we couldn't come to Mr. Mdao's uh, assistance. Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chief Justice, but it's unfortunate that you did not even refer to the case, that you say you think, but anyway, I will leave it there. Yeah. Right. Commissioner Lucas? Thank you very much, uh, Deputy Chief Justice. Good morning. Uh, Good morning, Commissioner. Judge Smith, I, you see me now, you are not afraid anymore. Can, can you please just uh, say, maybe sit close, I can't. You are not afraid anymore because <laughs> you see me now. Yes. So, <laughs> uh, I, was, I, was, I was going to ask you the same question that I, must, that I asked the, the previous candidate. Yeah. And that is with regards to what is your view with regards to the transformation of the bench and also the outlook of the bench as it, as it is currently. And I want to go further and ask you a question that I think Honorable uh, Advocate Belay asked it before now. Is do you also believe that women with the same training and the equal qualification 
still needs to be developed more before they can qualify to become a judge. I just, I'm just adding it to the issue of transformation and the outlook of the bench. Yes. Thank you. I, as I, uh, do, do I understand your question to be that is it necessary for women uh, to, be, to be developed more to become judges, even though they have the same qualifications and same experience as their male counterparts? Or should I put it like that? Do you think with the same training and the same qualifications as yourself, any woman is a, with that kind of background is on the same level as yourself to be appointed as a judge? I'm putting it very simple. Yes, no. <laughs> no, you, of course, the, the answer, uh, uh, Commissioner, is of course uh, a woman must be, uh, must be uh, entitled to be, to be considered on, on the same basis. And, and accepting also that if you, if you have if you have regard to our uh, patriarchal uh, society and domination and uh, how women have been treated in the past and, 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 uh, and discriminated against, then one must accept there is a need to put measures in place to, to level the playing fields. Uh, but a lot of it, lo a lot has been done, um, but clearly we are not there yet. So. So I have to concede uh, that in, in a situation where uh, the requirements of demographics and, and, uh, and repre uh, representativity of a court requires the appointment at a, uh, of a woman, then I must yield to, to that. Unfortunately, that, that is the reality. Um, one can, can hope if you come here that uh, there being five positions that, uh, that you can be accommodated uh, uh, without, without the commission having to compromise those important considerations of representativity um, and, and uh, demographical uh, 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 makeup of, of the courts. I hope I've answered your question, uh, Commissioner. And your general view of the outlook of the bench in terms of transformation. Just your view, and how do you see, how can we really reach equality or equity in terms of making sure that transformation is really a living uh, uh, imperative within yes. the judiciary? Yes, thanks, uh, thank you, Commissioner. Yep. I, I can only speak from an Eastern Cape point of view, knowing what is going on in the Eastern Cape. And the judge president of the Eastern Cape has gone out of his way to invite women to, to act. Uh, on any particular term, there would be more women than men, or there would be equality. But, but the outlook in that particular division, if I, if I have regard to women who have been acting there, who are clearly ready now to come to this august body and, and present themselves for, for appointment, I. I am encouraged. It's a bit more difficult for me to, to make a comment from a, from a national point of view, but uh, I can only speak uh, parochially uh, uh, about the Eastern Cape, and, and it looks, the outlook is, is, is encouraging, if I can put it as, as high as that. Yes, we are speaking about women, uh, but also generally in terms of representation on, 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 on the demographical spread, generally, if you speak about race, if you speak about gender, and all of that, what is your view? It, I, I think, first of all, it, it, uh, it is a constitutional imperative that, uh, that all bodies, uh, I'm talking about organs of state or other bodies which are really governmental bodies, must make sure that that constitutional imperative is, is implemented. And, and where, as is in the case of women, for example, there has been a history of, uh, of, 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 uh, of oppression and pushing aside isolation and all those things, then measures need to be put in place to, to enhance opportunities for, for women. 
So I'm, I'm talking about uh, affirmatively making sure that, uh, that the playing fields are, are leveled uh, in, in all those respects. To me, it, it is a constitutional imperative and it just must be done. Um, whether there are certain sectors that like it or not, uh, uh, it, it really doesn't matter. It's something that needs to be done. And we all know that while there's clearly a lot has been done in this regard, but uh, it, we, we are clearly not there yet. It, it, this, it, one cannot deny that, so a lot more has to be done. But, but I am encouraged because I can begin to see the seeds of, of, of these uh, measures being implemented, and as I say, I can only speak from the Eastern Cape High Court point of view, and, and already if that is representative uh, of what is going on in other parts of the country, and I don't have any reason to believe that it is not, then we, I think we're in, in a good place so far as that is concerned. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you, DCJ. Uh, good morning, Judge Smith. Good mo morning, sorry, I lost you a bit. I, I think I'm, I'm partly covered by uh, Commissioner Lewis here, but I, I just want you to share with us as to what is it that you as an individual have contributed uh, in seeing that women are being assisted in getting work or assisted in being empowerment while you were still an attorney in your law firm? Oh, yes. Now, we, we, uh, we at, at, at our firm, we had a policy of making sure that we employ uh, young women as, uh, as, as candidate attorneys. We have produced, I, I cannot even tell you numbers because there's been so many of them that has, has gone through the firm. Um, and it was a deliberate policy um, which, which, we, which we implemented. And uh, uh, even though initially uh, there was some resistance in the firm when we were doing that because obviously there were some people that wanted uh, family and friends to be to be appointed, and when we preferred women over them, they were but unhappy. But but those uh, those objections and concerns very vanished very quickly when they had to concede that the appointments were good ones, that they covered themselves in glory, all of them, um, that they didn't have to stand back for for their male uh, counterparts, and, uh, and they acquitted themselves with uh, distinction. So, yes, we, we have done the firm. I can't say ever since I left in 2010, but while I was there, uh, many of, of, our, of our products, if I can say that, or protégés have gone on to become magistrates, and, uh, and some of them are successful uh, uh, advocates today, and. Uh, some of them have their own legal firms, so we're very proud of that uh, achievement. Okay, thank you, Judge Smith. Another question that I'm having for you as a judge, what assistance are you giving acting judges, particularly women, to be better judges? No, we, do we, do we, I, I think in, in, in the, the Eastern Cape, uh, with the, with the leadership of the, of the JP, um, it is a policy that we go out of our way to assist not only women judges, but all, uh, all judges, all acting judges, particular those that come for the first time, because do we know how daunting it is when you, when you go, when you become a judge for the first time, when you act, and you, you are a bit bewildered. So we do go out of our way to give them all the assistance that we can, the one thing that you can do, that you cannot do, sorry, is to, is to write judgments on their behalf. They have to do it themselves. But where they come, we make it very clear that uh, uh, give them all the assistance, and if they come to you for advice, you, you give it and, and try, to, it, try to assist as much as you can. And, and it, it becomes clear very quickly 
um, which of those acting judges are going to to go on and 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 become permanent judges and be very successful uh, uh, in in the future. Uh, so it is uh, it is a fulfilling uh, exercise to to be able to do that uh, when you're generally my experience not only myself generally my experience is that all the senior judges enjoy doing that they go out of their way to do it and I don't know if there's ever been any uh, complaints to the judge president that uh, they have been treated badly my last question uh, judge Smith you were born in the Eastern Cape and you you were raised there. I assume that now you, you understand this course of very well. <laughs> yes, I, I do. I must I must admit that my understanding of his course is very basic, which is uh, a a bit of a a, a bit of a um, um, I won't say embarrassment, but uh, I should have I should have done better because I grew up with friends who were closer speaking, and instead they all learned to speak Afrikaans fluently, and I I I, I was left behind. But mm -hmm. but uh, but I understand understand. That okay. Other members of my family are fluent um, in mm. this course. Okay. What is your thinking on the notion that uh, judges, uh, I mean judgment? must be written at least in one African language. Oh, I, I, I agree with that. Um, I, I, can just, I can just imagine the, the, I referred earlier to, to my, the article that I wrote in the uh, CJ uh, journal. And the, of course, the, the core uh, message in the article was that judgments should be accessible. And what can be more accessible than being able to read a judgment in your, in your own language? So I, I think it's a, it's a good idea. I know that the, the deputy CJ has written a few, a few judgments. And uh, the, the idea that, that, uh, that Litigants, or shall I not say lay people, but non-lawyers are not interested in reading judgments. Is is is? It, I don't just subscribe to that idea. I don't think it's true. People want to understand. If a case go, especially if a case go uh, against them, they want to understand the basis of the pronouncement, and and uh, and if that can be expressed uh, simply and in the vernacular, all the better. So I think it's a it is a good, it is a good idea. It, it's still, it's still, I, I was born Afrikaans speaking, but it, it's still uh, uh, surprising how many judgments you would still find in, in Afrikaans when in fact there's, there's no, none in Isikosa, for example, that, uh, that come come before us, at least in the Eastern Cape, where would you, would have ex you, you expect those judgments. Unfortunately, I, <laughs> I will not be in a position to produce such a judgment myself, but I think there are judges, and, and I think the idea has been born, and I'm sure that soon you're going to find many judgments written in this course. Thank you, Judge Smith. Thank you, Thank you DCJ. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Good morning, Judge Smith. Good morning, uh, Acting President. Would you care to remind me when you were invited to come and act at the SCA it for was, the first time? It was in October, October last year, CJ. Thank you. And you will recall that I gave you a call and we had a long chat yes. about the do's and don'ts, what would be required of you yes. 
and the practices and conventions of the SCA. Yes. And I strongly recommend it to you that you should ask your secretary to send you a copy of our style guide. Yes. And that style guide has an addendum to it, which is a template for SCA judgments. Yeah. At this point, I want to refer you to your judgment, Municipal Employees Pension Fund, yes. but for a different reason. Yes. It's at page 16 of your bundle. Yes. It's one of the judgments that you... Yes. Yes. Are you there? Yes, I am. And if you look at page two of that judgment. Yes. Just before, below the two transverse lines order. Yes. Then first of all, it shows or indicates where the appeal from which court it emanated. Yes. And it gives the name of the judges. Yes. But nowhere does it indicate whether those judges set as a court of first instance or as a court of appeal. Do you see that? I see that, yes. And yet, This is what you would have been told or seen by reading the style guide. Yes. And if you turn over to the next page, paragraph one of your judgment, the last sentence, Perhaps even before I pose my next question to you, shall we settle this? Those three judges set as a court of appeal, eh? that is the full court, they constituted the full court. Yes. And in paragraph one, the last sentence says, the appeal is with the leave of this court. Mm. Meaning the SCA. Yes. Was that factually correct? I I cannot I must confess that I cannot recall uh, 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 Deputy President because the appeal emanating from a full court, section 161B of the Superior Courts Act tells us that it can only go to the SCA by virtue of special leave, which can only be granted by the SCA. Yes. And that was lost on you. I don't understand. Are you saying that it should have stated that this is with the special leave of the yes, of the appeal court? Because it it is what that was what it was. Yes. And that was lost on you, yes. as is apparent from your judgment. Yes. There's one instance when one of your judgments delivered 
which had to be recalled a day or two after its delivery. Do you recall that? Yes, incident? I do. I do recall that, yes. And would, would you enlighten this commission as to how that came about? Yes. Um, what, what happened was that uh, I think that was the cornerstone. That was the cornerstone judgment. And um, if, if you have regard to that judgment, you will see that there was a plethora of different companies involved in, at different levels. And I think the, the, the mistake came in when a reference was made to uh, one of the other companies. But if you had read the, the paragraph in context, it would have been clear that, that this was just a, a mistake. It was a typographical error that crept in. And uh, I think it was Judge uh, Govan who drew it to, to, to my attention. And uh, we immediately, uh, with the, with the uh, uh, acquiescence of the presiding judge, we decided we're going to, to, to correct that. Um, that, that, is, that is the circumstance under which that happened. That mistakes and the elementary ones relating to your municipal employees' pension fund judgment, are they not indicative of the fact that you pay less attention to detail? No. On issues that matter? N no, uh, uh, Deputy President. I, I pride myself that. Uh, that I am a person that uh, I'm meticulous in writing my judgments. I think an overview of my judgments, including those that, uh, that I have penned at the Supreme Court of Appeal, will, will testify to, to that. Um, mistakes do creep in. Um, I have had a look at many reported judgments where there were obvious errors uh, in the judgments uh, which had to be subsequently corrected in the, in the law reports. Um, so I do not believe that it is uh, an indication of, of, my, uh, 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 of me approaching the drafting of judgment in a perfunctory or superficial, or superficial manner. But that's all belied by what happened in the matter of municipal employees' uh, pension fund, because the style guide was there. Yes. Had you paid attention to it, these elementary mistakes would have been avoided. Yes. I it, 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 it is there, uh, Deputy President. What, what can I say about it? It, it, uh, it? Those things, I want to believe that they do happen. Uh, we all as judges try to, to limit them as much as possible going through your judgments every now and then. But uh, I do think that they do creep in from time to time. If, of course, they, are, uh, they fundamentally vitiate your, your judgment, then it is a different matter. Um, but I mean that it's as far as I can take it. You have been on the bench for, for 12 years. Yes. And uh, according to the report from comments by the GCB, the list of judgments written by you, which they considered, yes. they listed only three reported judgments. Yes. yes is that, is that the sum, sum total of no, reported there, judgments? No, there are other judgments that they missed. There is one particular judgment. I think I mentioned that uh, in, in a previous application when I was still acting. There was a reported judgment in 1998. I can look at it if you want to. 
And then also there was another judgment that, uh, that was reported, which is uh, Rendell versus Law Society, but I didn't list that one because that was one, the one that was overturned by the Supreme Court of Appeal. Um, the, 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 there are two other judgments which I thought uh, clearly would have been uh, reported if it were not for the fact that, uh, that they had to go to the Constitutional Court first for, the, uh, for, for confirmation of an order that I made declaring a law to be, to be invalid, which was the, the ShopRite, ShopRite checkers matter and uh, the Mdodana versus the, the Premier matter. Um, the ShopRite checkers matter was then, the Constitutional Court judgment was, was then uh, reported. Um, I do not think that, that my judgment was reported. I think they were holding back for the Constitutional Court confirmation of my, of my judgment. But you uh, So you, yeah. you only had about five, you have, it's five now. Yes. Over 12 years. Yes. I, the, the Deputy President, I have, uh, I have written many judgments. Um, I'm sure that some of my colleagues will also agree. You mark those judgments as reportable and where you think clearly that uh, either because of new law being, uh, being made in the judgment or, or confirmation of a, of a legal principle based on a novel set of facts or uh, where uh, the, the, the subject matter of the judgment is topical. And uh, I suppose that that gets presented to, to the uh, to the people who, who decide whether or not judgments should be included. I have never actively uh, attempted to, to, to push for the inclusion of my judgments, and maybe I should have done that. I know about some colleagues who, who, who have done that, and I think that maybe I should have. But, uh, but, but I think an overview of my judgments will, will uh, will indicate that I have, I have made a contribution uh, to, to the law, to the understanding of the law uh, over a long, a long period of time. I, I, cannot, I cannot answer for why some of those judgments were not, uh, were not reported when in my view they clearly should have, report, uh, should have been reported. But you would know that judgments are reported in the law reports, that is, Judah or Butterworth, if they yes. have any presidential value. Yes, that is correct. And there is a world of difference between a judgment written <clears throat> by a judge who indicates that it is reportable and a reported judgment. Yes, yes there is. Thank you, Judge Smith. Thank you, Deputy President. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Uh, 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 J. Uh, good day, uh, Judge uh, Smith. Good, good day, Commissioner. Thank you. Um, just to follow up on the question. Yes that uh, the acting uh, president raised in relation to your reported yes. uh, judgments. <clears throat> in the questionnaire where you are asked to provide uh, at least, I mean, ten, up to 10 uh, yes. judgments, <clears throat> which you consider uh, significant um, you only list uh, seven. Yes. Um, is that out of modesty or is a factual situation? No. I have, uh, I don't want to exaggerate, but, but 
I must have written over 200 of, or 250 to 300 judgments over the period of time. Contrary to what is believed, the Eastern Cape courts are very, very busy. I have, uh, I have been doing recess duty for the past two weeks, and I walked away with about five uh, reserve judgments, which I have to deliver within the next few weeks. So I've written many judgments. I, I, there, there are so many of those judgments that I believe that made a, a, a contribution, and I listed the important ones. The, 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 if, if you can just allow me to, to, to give you an example of how it is the essence of, of, uh, of, of uh, being a judge, that there's always this possibility of colleagues differing with you. I wrote a judgment on, uh, which is referred to in, in, in my list, which is ShopRite Checkers versus the MEC, the matter that went to the Constitutional Court for confirmation. That judgment dealt with the crucial issue of what is property for the purposes of Section 25 of the Constitution. Um, there, and, and it dealt with that issue in particular in the, uh, in, in the context of a liquor license that had been issued to ShopRite checkers. But to complicate matters further, it was not only a liquor license, it was a, what was called a grocer's wine license, which meant that they were entitled to sell wine in their grocery stores. They didn't have to have separate premises. So the question that arose is the first question to be determined was whether that particular governmental largesse, which is essentially the government giving a license to you, if it qualifies as, uh, as property in terms of Section 25, because Section 25 is clear that it's not only land that is property. I found that it has all the characteristics of property, namely that it is clearly definable, that it is identifiable, it has commercial value, it can be transferred, it, there's permanency, it's permanent for as long as you comply with the, with the, the regulations and conditions. And there were other issues as well, of course, whether there has been deprivation, uh, 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 whether, whether the, 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 there's been deprivation, yes, of the, of the property, or whether there needs to be the, the, the justifiable limitation exercise in terms of Section 36. But that, on that issue, the other issues, of course, there was, on that issue, the majority agreed with my finding on, on the issue of property, but disagreed with me on the issue as to whether, in fact, there has been a justifiable limitation of the property, because I found that the license had been taken away in its entirety. The majority disagreed. They say there was, said there was, a, uh, there was a justifiable limitation, and the reason provided by the province was, was sufficient. But even on that, score the majority, there, were, there was a judgment written by Madlanga Jay, which I think one of the acting judges concurred in, which agreed with me whole scale on all the issues. Judge Moseneke disagreed with the finding of the majority that that license constituted property, and I think including the, the then Chief Justice uh, also disagreed with that. So, so what you have is that in one, <clears throat> in one panel, there were more than four or five different views on the, on the same aspect. And I have no doubt that if you superimpose another court on top of the, con <clears throat> sorry, the constitutional court, you will find that there may be judges who make different pronouncements. So you, you're always going to find that uh, colleagues may disagree. Your judgments can be overturned. Uh, 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 even even <clears throat> in the SCA, there are cases where judges decide to write min minority judgments. Simply means that if you had decided that issue on your own, you would have been overturned by your, by your colleagues. But what is important in my view is that Anybody who reads your judgment say, I disagree with this finding, 
but but must not be able to say that, look, he missed the point completely. He misconstrued the law, didn't get the facts right, he was just off, then that is bad. But where on the facts, the proper facts, and it's common cause that those are the facts, that's the factual metrics on which you must now apply the law and make your findings. If you, if you give a reasonable exposition of why you reach that decision, I think that is the duty of, of, of a judge. And uh, even with regard to the issue of, uh, of reportable, reportable judgments, I've, I've many judgments that I can refer to. For example, I had one judgment that I wrote on, uh, on, on the circumstances under which the corporate veil of a, of a corporate entity, a company or a corporation can be pierced. And I thought that those were unique circumstances. The application of the law uh, demanded a unique approach, and I put that judgment forward to, for, for consideration for, for, uh, for reporting, and uh, just nothing, just simply nothing happened. So unfortunately, you don't have control over, over that process. You can just do the best that you can with the case and the facts that is presented to you. Just, just, just a follow-up, uh, <coughs> SHA. So your position uh, is that um, the seven listed is an understatement. Yes. And um, now the second question: How does it, as a judge, uh, how does it make you feel uh, if your judgment finds its way into a, a law report? It, it. Uh it, I mean, we, we were proud of that fact. Even, even when I was an attorney, we had many, many cases reported in the law reports. And yes, it does make you feel proud uh, uh, that other, others have recognized your judgment and have seen, have, have seen in your judgment what you thought were there. But sometimes it, it, just, doesn't, it just doesn't happen that way. And, and I have been less and less, initially it bothered me quite a lot, and I spoke to some of my colleagues and they said, look, you, you need to be more proactive, because they gave examples as so and so, such and such a case where I had to phone so and so and say, look, do you understand why, what is going on in this case, and why is it that you're not, you don't consider it reportable? But, but I haven't done that, for, and that is for one reason only, I, I don't want to, I don't want to minimize the, the, the law reports or the fact that judgments are reportable, but the fact of the matter is that things have changed so much since I started practicing. Now, you go on to the Supreme Court of Appeal website, you can find any judgment that you would not find in the law reports, and some of those judgments are very, very helpful for your case. You go on to Safley, you can find any judgments. It is just the technological advances has just opened things up. I'm not saying that, that judges have become obsolete because I am one of those that still, that still enjoy reading on paper and, and remember better when I enjoy reading. But, but very soon, it's, it's not going to matter any longer because even now when, when I hear cases most of the judgments, well, on the, on the established points of law, you'd always have reported judgments. But most of the judgments were, get, are judgments that you won't find in the law reports. But because they are so accessible, counsel is able to pick and choose uh, and give you judgments that you never heard about. And you read those judgments and you think that, well, this is actually such a good exposition of the, of the law. It should have been in the law reports, but, but it's not. But, but I'm just saying that, uh, to answer your question, I must admit that it does make you proud, but, but soon, soon it is, it is not going to matter. Nobody's, and, and I think you will find that most of, of, of the counsel and attorneys are uh, using uh, uh, the, the electronic medium more and more, and have better access to, 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 to judgments.
Okay. I, I take your point, Judge, that um, with um, sorry. Yes. No, no. Maybe let me leave it at that, uh, T. C. J. Uh, yeah. Taking into account what you are saying. Thank you so much. Yes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Judge uh, Smith. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I take that into account, Judge. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yes. I mean, Sorry, thanks. All right, thanks. Commissioner Nikis? Uh, thank you, TCJ. Uh, good, good morning, Judge Smith. Morning, Commissioner. Judge Smith is quick uh, uh, questions. Um, in respect of the comments that have been made um, in respect of your candidature by various uh, bodies, they speak so well about you, mm. especially the GCB at 5.1, where they say the candidate's commitment to the Constitution is reflected in his participation in the Eastern Cape Democratic Lawyers Association yes. Secretary from 1983 to 1985 and in Nadel, National Vice President, 1989 to 1990 and so forth. Yes. Have you what, what 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 could be how that assisted you in terms of your contribution to transformation of the legal profession? It, it, yes, it it uh, it played it played a very very important role in my in my approach to any case that I that I sit on. If you if you just allow me in order to 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 illustrate uh, uh, my point, if you just allow me to to say this, it's either not recognised or people forget about the fact that in 1992, already 1991 or 1992, when the then uh, 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 military government purported to introduce a a, a, a constitution decree, that is what it was called, and brought into being a justiciable bill of rights. They didn't <laughs> intend to do that, but the fact of the matter is when we read the constitution, we saw, wow, this is what they've done. A, a, a imported whole scale uh, international concepts of, of jurisprudence insofar as, as the as the recognition of, of rights are concerned, the justiciability of rights, the derogation of rights, and the limitation of those rights. So, so we were then, and of course we didn't know much about constitutional law. All these issues were new, having come from a, from a, from, from a jurisprudence where, where parliament was supreme. But we were then able to challenge uh, the the National Security Act, insofar as it provided for, for, uh, for detention without trial, and also uh, uh, a blanket ban on, on meetings. But in doing that, we had to prove, of course, there was this repugnancy between these acts and the Constitution which was now introduced. And there was even an attempt, when they realized what they had done, there was an attempt to, to to, to, to repeal, to repeal that constitution. So, but we succeeded. And, and in the second leg of the case, we were, first there was a declarator of repugnancy and that it actually derogates from those fundamental constitutional rights. And as a second leg, we went back to court and actually got those laws to be, to be declared invalid. So the, the long and the short of it was that the Siskai government, which was, then even just the uh, Sky Security Police was just an extension of the South African Security Police. We're no longer able to detain people. And, uh, and, and also the assaults in prison also, also uh, uh, came, almost came to, well, not a complete halt, but, but there were no, not so many of those assaults any longer. But I'm saying this because that is the, uh, the, the jurisprudence that have informed me when I became a judge, 
and I look at all the cases from that point of view, rightly or wrongly. Yeah. <coughs> that, is, that is who I am. Yeah. Now, um, there's this, uh, this question about the report or the reported judgments. Yeah. I think it's not only a question to you. All candidates have been asked this question. Yes. The concern I have is if you have marked your judgment reportable, thereafter you just don't have a control, somebody else uh, yeah. takes over. That is, it is dealt with by, some, by yes. editors, some other person who takes their own decisions, taking into account. How best can we um, all, can, uh, how best can we ensure that this process of reporting <coughs> judgment Taking into account what you've just said about the new technology, other means of, yes. of reporting judgment, how best can we balance this and make sure that at least there is transparency on how, because we find out that some other judges have many reported judgments, yes. others simply don't have, though they mark their own judgments yes. reportable. Well, how that can be done? I, I think, I think the problem is that uh, that what, what I have been told, at least by one of my colleagues who knows uh, something about what goes on there, is that the, the publishers get flooded with judgments. It is, you can just imagine how many judgments come before them and how many have been, have been marked uh, uh, reportable or not. But, but I think the, the fundamental decision that we have to make is that, is that still going to be the basis on which you, you, you're going to be assessed? Uh, is it still, the end all and the be all if your judgment does not appear in Juta or the all law reports. Um, and if we recognize that things have changed, that, uh, that there are many, many judgments that have not been reported, and some of them not even on Safley, you know, that, I mean, that is, was another one of my difficulties. I spoke to, to our registrar once and asked, asked him, how are these judgments placed on Safley? Because I had delivered, in about a month, I delivered many judgments, and some of them, although I didn't think that they would be reportable in the sense of you put them in Juta, but I thought that if, if this, and I referred it to my other colleagues as well, and I thought that if other judges see this and the research that I have done in this judgment, it can help them. So if it is placed on Safley, it is going to be so much more accessible to them. And then it's not there, but what is there then is a one pager that I wrote on, on, on leave to appeal. And I say, but why is this even on Safely? What contribution is it going to make? Because I wrote a simple judgment that doesn't say anything new, that simply say that I am of the view that there's no reasonable prospects of success. Why do you place it here, and why are those other judgments not here? And all that he could say to me is that, well, I just give it to them, and they decide what to do. But it's those type of things which it's a bit anomalous and incongruous, and, and it, it, it also led me to say, well, I, I can just do what I'm supposed to do, what I, what, what, what I take uh, a particular care to do is that if I write any judgment where I think my colleagues would benefit from that, then it is uh, make sure that I have a special effort. Well, we circulate all the judgments, make a special effort to say, you may want to look at this judgment because it's a matter that come, can come before you in, in, in the near future. But, but I think that, that is, it, 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 maybe we must just accept that things have changed fundamentally, that, uh, 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 yeah, I'm going on a bit. Thank you, Tsuji. Uh, thank you, DCJ. Uh, I'm covered. Thank you. Do we have questions from the virtual platform? Commissioners Bernard and Breitenbach? Yes, Commissioner Bernard. Thank you. Sorry, I might have spoken over to Breitenbach. Um, the uh, Judge Smith, you mentioned the matter of Randall versus the Cape Law Society, which was a um, 
judgment they have given, I think Judge McCall, another candidate that appeared before us in the interview, um, that you were the scribe. So in that matter, you ordered the stay of, ordered the stay of a, a striking off uh, application where the legal practitioner involved had misappropriated substantial funds um, that were intended for an education trust. So that's just to uh, <coughs> summarize the fact, hopefully. I, I call it the education trust because there was a primary school as a beneficiary. Yes. So uh, the, the, the criticism from the Supreme Court of Appeal in overturning your judgment they seem to indicate that you pay too much attention to the, the legal practice involved and the trust account conduct of the particular practitioner and not uh, enough attention to the protection of the public in the hands of the scrupulous practitioner. So, just to, on that, do you have any comment on this? Yes. Why did you <coughs> yes. occur and then, you know, what lessons have you learned from that matter? Yes, I, I have, that is the one judgment that uh, that I still mull over my, my mind over and over. You will recall that, that one of the core issues in the judgment is whether the court has discretion to stay such proceedings pending criminal uh, 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 action, uh, criminal proceedings to be instituted, or criminal proceedings which have already been instituted, where the person say the following, look, I, if, if, if you force me to face this disciplinary inquiry, I am not going to have any resources to defend myself in the criminal matter. I'm going to exhaust all my resources. And it was an issue that, uh, that and I think I referred to it in, in, in my case as well, that internationally has occupied uh, many courts internationally on this issue. I was of the view that, that yes, the court must have, even though some of the, the appellate division decisions, the old appellate division uh, decisions uh, held in the circumstance where there was a, a, a statutory uh, obligation or imperative on the person to appear before the body, that in such a case the court it is required. But those cases never said that the court as a part of its inherent discretion, cannot, where the circumstances justify such an order and where otherwise uh, an injustice would be done to the person. So I approach it from the point of view, that if you force this man to fight this case, he is going to be, he's, he's not going to have any resources, he is going to be compromised insofar as his, uh, as his, uh, 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 criminal case is concerned. And it, to a, in, in, in a sense, it was a judgment call on the circumstances of, the, of that case. And the reason why I was inclined in that direction was exactly the, the lethargy and the supine attitude of the, of, the, of the law society in taking such a long time to, 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 to take action against the man. It must also be remembered that what happens now is that it's viewed through the, uh, uh, the wisdom of hindsight because it has been established in the criminal case, it has been established subsequently that he has actually uh, 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 defrauded the school in that manner. But at the time, those were allegations. In the end, he had a version that he put before me. And I often think whether I I should have decided the case differently, but I think that if I were part of a panel uh, uh, facing those set of facts, I would probably not have decided differently. Um, and I differ with respect with the with the with the the ratio and the gist of the of the judgment that says that. The court doesn't have that discretion as a matter of course. It cannot do that, otherwise the administration of justice would come into disrepute. I, I don't think that can be the case because what I also said in my judgment is that there's a discretion, but it needs to be exercised conservatively and only in deserving cases. So I thought that maybe if the court found differently 
it would have differed with me on the facts of the case and say that, well, we do have a discussion to do that in appropriate circumstances, but in this case, uh, uh, the, the applicant has not made out a case for, for, for such relief. But yeah, I'd, I'd, I still think it would be very interesting with the right set of, of, of facts, for example, what the Constitutional Court would say about whether or not courts have that uh, discretion to make such an order in appropriate circumstances, provided that it be used as conservatively as possible. I hope I've answered your question, Commissioner. Thank you. Well, you have answered it. The, the, the second, just a last question I have. If the JSC were not to appoint you to the SCA, what would the SCA be missing out on? Um, I, I have, I think it, it, uh, it appears from my judgments. I have a good understanding of the law. I've got experience in, in my legal practice I had vast experience in, in constitutional law. Even before I came to the bench, administrative law, um, I have reasonable experience in other areas of the law as well. Uh, the Law Society, not, sorry, the, the, the GCB, I think, refers to one of my recent judgments in the matter of Funda versus MEC, which involved uh, complicated cases of legal, of, of, of medical uh, negligence issues where I had to, to, to assess the evidence and the, and the, uh, 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 the weight of, of the evidence of many uh, authorities, uh, neonatal pediatricians and obstetricians and uh, all other uh, 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 experts, medical experts that gave evidence before me and I had to make sure that I understand what they're saying and, and, and I think that judgment is, a, is, is, as far as I'm concerned, is a good indication that I do have the ability to look at complicated facts, complicated legal situations and give a reasonable judgment that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, um, DCJ. Thank you, Judge Smith. Thank you. President, but there has a follow-up question for you. Go ahead. Thank you, Deputy Chief Justice. Judge Smith, you would have been provided with the comments from the GCB yes. by the Secretariat. Yes, I saw that, yes. And from which you would have seen that they say they considered three, only three reported judgments from you and yes. also listed un, uh, unreported decisions, yes. Yes. which in total are 19. Yes. And you say that over the years you wrote more than 200 judgments. Yes. No. Did, did it occur to you perhaps that you would need to, uh, you know, to prepare a list of all those judgments no, I must and provide the list to the commission. No, I, I, I must, uh, I must, uh, I must admit that it did not con uh, occur to me. I thought that if I provide judgments that would show this body that I have a good understanding of the law, that I'm able to make sense of, of a, a factual matrix and I'm able to apply the law and give a reasonable, concise judgment that, uh, that, that uh, tells the reader why I came to a particular conclusion that that would be sufficient. Um, Thank of you. Course, no. Sorry, of, of course, many, uh, Deputy President, many of those judgments are matters where four on four or five pages you, you simply dismiss the case or grant the relief. They're not all erudite expositions of the law. So I wouldn't have wanted to burden this body with, uh, with uh, some of those. 
Thank you. I'm satisfied, Judge thank Smith. Let's, let's leave it at that. Yes, thank you. Thank you, uh, DCJ. Uh, lastly and quickly, uh, Judge Smith, I forgot to ask you earlier. You, you, in, you mentioned in your application form that you were involved with the CFM task team. What, what is that? Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I actually saw late on that. I just, uh, I just uh, assumed that that acronym <laughs> would have become quite well known. It's a case flow management task team, oh, uh, which was established for... by the previous Chief Justice and I and uh, Judge Griffith served on no, the. No, I, I know yeah. what it is. I yeah. just didn't know the. Yeah, the sorry, acronym. sorry. I should have, <laughs> I should okay. have made it clear. You you listed two outstanding well, reserve judgments in your application form from the SCA. Yes. Have those been delivered? Yes, they have been. Both of They've them. They've been both delivered in time. Yes. All right. Yes. Thank you so much, uh, Judge Smith. Uh, we've reached the end of your interview. Thank you. Unless you have anything you want to ask us, uh, you're free to go. No, definitely not. I thank you very much. And to all the commissioners also, thank you.